Welcome to uh, this evening's uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting. I'm so glad that you've linked in and joined with us for this prayer experience. You know, we're getting really close to Christmas. It's just, uh, golly, it's uh, December 16th, so we're just, uh, uh, you know, a, a, about a week or so away from uh, the Christmas holidays. It's going to be a great time, and I hope that you're going to enjoy it. We have our Christmas movie coming up. Uh, that's going to be released here at our church and uh, be put on live live stream that you're going to be able to share with others. It's going to be such a great experience. Be in prayer for our uh, worship teams and such that are going to be um, uh, uh, they're still putting the finishing touches on this production to get it out to you. Uh, already, you've had some resources released to you that are pretty exciting. And uh, so, anyway, be, be let's be in prayer for that. We also want to be in prayer for. Um, uh, all of our families that are going to be uh, getting ready for family vacations and such as school wraps up this week and, and then uh, families getting together. We want to pray that as families gather that their health would be, that they'd be safe with their health and all of that. Um, we want to continue to pray for our church, rejoice in the big missions offering and the generosity of our church in giving the missions for this next year. Wow, uh, that's been so encouraging, as well as just your financial giving and the faithfulness of your financial giving uh, this year. It's such a tough year, such a, 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 a disruptive year, and yet you have been so utterly faithful. It's just glorious. Uh, it's great to be your pastor. Anyway, um, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and then dive in. We're going to continue our study in First Peter here on Wednesday nights, and uh, I do hope you're enjoying this study, uh, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you right now. We pray for our world. We pray, dear Father God, for an end to this uh, COVID virus issue. We pray that uh, this vaccine that has been uh, rolled out, Lord God, that it would be effectively distributed and have a, a health effect on our nation and our world that would be profound. And Father God, we pray for our government leaders at this uh, transitional time in our country. We pray, dear Heavenly Father God, for our community uh, and our church. We pray for our church to thrive and grow. We thank you, dear Lord, for the faithfulness of your people through the giving uh, to not only our ministry here at Bellevue, but also to our partnership in ministry through our big missions offering. Lord, thank you that you let us be a part of this great mission and that you've given us uh, prosperity so that we can prosper your mission through our giving. Lord God, we pray for those that are sick, that you would heal them, for those that are troubled, that you would encourage them, uh, that those that are lonely, that you would connect them. And uh, Father God, we pray for our families to be healthy. We pray for our family vacations and family uh, gatherings this next week, two weeks, and so. And we pray, dear Father God, that all would go well. We thank you uh, for uh, all that is being done to release the movie uh, through our church called The Christmas Key. We pray that this would be a great evangelistic tool that we can use to share Christ with our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, and people that we know all over the world because it'll be online, so it'll be available, and we can uh, point people to it all over the world. And so, Father God, we just pray that so many people would hear the gospel, that so many people would come to Christ through this production this year. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's take a look at the scriptures here today. We start with verse 13 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. The Bible says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were trans ransomed from the feudal ways inherent from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in him. Having pur pur purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, 
Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. And then chapter 2. So you, so put away, rather, all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. May God add the blessing to the reading and hearing of this is word. I want to give you the central idea of my lesson here today, and that is this. Uh, because God has given us such a glorious salvation, believers are highly motivated to live a holy life. Since God has given you such a great salvation, you're going to want to live for him and live well in him. Verse 13 says, therefore, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, what I want to do here is uh, talk to you very, very briefly today about six motivations for living holy in an unholy world. Six motivations. We get it right from this text that I just read. First of all, number one, God has saved and will save us. God has saved us and he will save us. Verse 13 that we just read. We want, you see, to live holy. Because God has done something so gracious for us. Have you ever been treated so nicely by someone that you could not help but have a strong desire to live in a way that was worthy of their kindness to you? Uh, God has saved us and so we want to live according to the nature and the essence of his love. And, And the Bible refers to the time when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's going to be revealed and we want to be worthy of his revelation. This speaks of the time when Christ comes and our salvation is made complete. You know, there are three phases to our salvation. I've mentioned this just recently in a sermon. Uh, Let me say it again in this lesson. Uh, The three phases of salvation include justification, sanctification, and glorification. Let me explain. Justification happens immediately when we trust in Christ to save our soul. For the one who already believes this is for them. Salvation past, right? We, justification, if you've accepted Jesus, that's salvation past for you. You, you. you have been saved. Sanctification, however, it happens over the course of, a, of living your life in repentance and obedience. You're becoming more like Christ as you surrender more of yourself to his will. This is for the believer, salvation present. And then there's glorification, which happens when Christ returns and brings us to be with him forever, ultimately in the new heaven and the new earth, apart from sin and death. We are perfected in every way in that time. This is the completion of our salvation, and we await for this. For the believer, this is salvation future. You see, we were saved, salvation past. We're being saved, salvation present. We're going to be saved, salvation future glorification. In essence, I can say in justification, I have been saved. In sanctification, I'm being saved. In glorification, I will be saved. And God has done, is doing, and will complete such an eternal life-giving work in us. And how could we ever think of doing anything other than living a life worthy of this glorious past, present, future salvation that God has worked, wrought in us? You see, you do not live a holy life to gain salvation. No, you have been given such a glorious salvation that the impulse of the true believer is to live up to that salvation with all his or her love and might. The first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And why do you do that? Because he's given you all of himself. And it's so glorious that you want to respond. God has loved you, so you love him back. The second truth that we see in this text is this. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. You see, this is another motivation for us to live a holy life. Set your hope, the Bible says, fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed, when he comes again. He's coming again. You know, fundamental to our faith is the prophetic fact that Christ is coming back, the return of Jesus. There are five fundamentals 
of our biblical and evangelical faith. Let me go through them. Number one, the inspiration and infallibility of the scripture. Number two, the deity of Christ. Number three, the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. Number four, bodily, the bodily resurrection of Christ. And number five, the second coming of Christ to this earth. We believe that Jesus is coming again, and we want to be found by him when he comes again, doing his will. Scriptures speak of this many, many times, and we need to be the kind of people that are found doing the will of God when Christ returns. And we don't know when Christ's going to return. We have no idea of the day or hour. But we need to be ready, always living, as if Jesus could come back right this instant, because he can. And that's a great motivation for living a holy life. Jesus said, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know what day your Lord will come. A third motivation, a third motivation is this. We are meant to imitate the Lord. The Bible says in verses 14 and 15 that we're to do so as obedient children. I mean, what love? Our salvation brings us into God's family, right? John chapter 1 verse 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We're children of God the Father. We have become his children and he has become our loving and powerful Father. And because of that, we need to be imitators. Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, when he says, Be ye imitators of God as dearly loved children. You know, I, I, I can remember so many times when my kids would imitate me. They loved me, they knew I loved them, and so they wanted to be like me. God loves you. He's given you salvation and grace, and you should want to be like him. It's a great motivation, a great motivation to live a holy life. A fourth motivation for living a holy life is that God's word commands it. God's word commands it. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 says this, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's a command. That's a command. Do you believe this book? Do you? The Bible? To be God's word, I do. God's word commands that we live holy because he is holy. This is our motivation. God cares enough for us that he commands holiness in our life. He commands us to choose holiness. Are we going to be obedient? Are you going to be obedient to step into a life of holiness? A fifth motivation for uh, living a holy life in the Lord is that we are accountable to God's judgment. Verse 17 says that he judges each man's work impartially. Impartially, That means God will judge thoroughly. Live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Did, did, did you know that it's right to fear the Lord? The fear of a traffic cop can keep you from speeding, right? <laughs> uh, we ought not ever think that God has just left his post and isn't going to enact judgment or justice. No. We will reap what we sow. And so it is important that we live in a way that always keeps in mind that judgment is coming and coming right quickly. Peter's not talking here about a judgment concerning who is saved and who is damned, though. This is referring to a family judgment. The father is dealing with his beloved children. He judges. The idea here is that he judges in order to find something good. But don't you want him to find something good in you? Don't you want to hear those words that the Bible speaks of, those words at the end of time? Don't you want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I do. I want to hear that. And so that is a motivation for us to live in a way worthy of the good news of Jesus. And then the sixth and final motivation that we see in this text for living a holy life is that God's love warrants it. God's love warrants it. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory 
that is going to be revealed. You see, Peter saw the love of Jesus through his suffering on the cross. He, he, he saw this with his eyes, uh, his own eyes. Peter did. Peter saw Jesus on the cross suffering. And uh, this is a powerful, powerful thing. We see in verses 18 and following, he speaks of this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways. How, we, how was he ransomed? By the shed blood of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus showed his love by his shed blood for you. God has shown us an innumerable, or I say an immeasurable love. Doesn't it inspire us to live our lives surrendered to him? Whenever I've seen movies of Jesus, when Jesus was died on the cross, things like the movie the Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, and I see a rendition of the suffering of Jesus. It brings tears to my eyes, and I tremble. And you know what I want to do more than anything? I want to live a better life. I want to live in the holiness that God has made possible through his forgiveness, through his shed blood on the cross that was so costly. As you can see, Jesus suffered the wrath of God so that we could receive the grace of God in our life. And that ought to make us not take advantage of the grace of God, but that ought to make us want to live a, a worthy of the grace of God in our life. My friend, I hope you've been edified, sanctified, uh, blessed, uh, challenged in this word today. Peter has such valuable things to say here. I hope you've been blessed the last three weeks as we've, as we've studied this chapter and part of chapter two together uh, leading up to the holidays. I hope that you have been prepared to really celebrate in your salvation that's been made possible by the Christ that came in that first Christmas some 2,000 years ago. Well, I want to say this, and that is that for the next couple Wednesday nights, we will not be having the Wednesday night prayer meeting in light of the fact that we have our uh, Christmas and our New Year's um, uh, uh, holidays, and a lot of you are either traveling or gathering with family and vacating and, and uh, doing other activities. And so we will not be holding the Wednesday night prayer meeting online, live streamed, for until uh, the turn of the year. And then at that point, we'll announce again um, another uh, series of Wednesday night uh, online uh, prayer meeting experiences. Well, let me pray us out. Father God, thank you so very much for your grace, your mercy, your love, your, your salvation, this living hope that we have in Jesus. Lord God, may we live worthy of it. May we be holy as you are holy, for you have commanded it of us. And Lord, you have made it possible by forgiveness and grace for us to begin to make holy choices again and to have our lives aligned with you. Thank you for your mercy, your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you and good night.